Um, we have our third speaker, Ian, uh, from, uh, uh, sorry, from um, Murdoch University, a retired academic, Ian Barnes, and he's going to speak to us on fostering technological citizenship for the great transition, a missional challenge. Thank you so much, Ian. All my points are on one slide, so when that comes up, you can, you can anticipate what I'm going to say before I say it. Although the proposal we now do in the Anthropocene generated a huge discussion about whether there were enough signs geologically to designate this as a new geological era, the actual significance of that claim was that it, it registered the fact that we humans uh, collectively have had a massive impact on Earth systems. Um, and, and we can see that in terms of our resource use, our clearing of land or forests, our sequestering of water, waterways, um, biomass, a whole range of ways in which humanity has, in an extraordinary way, impacted on the operate, the, fun, the functioning, the, the fundamental functioning of our Earth systems. Um, of course, this is not just simply um, a few bits of tinkering. It's, the, it's a result of the creation of an extraordinary technological infrastructure um, which Peter Haff has designated as the technosphere. Its, um, its multiple components include food, energy, um, production, transportation, communication, information, finance, governance, education, healthcare, security. These in themselves are complex systems, but they are linked together within this extraordinary global technosphere. I thought I might just give you a, a, some sense of this. This is from a quote from um, um, some critics of Peter Haff, actually. The technological macro system includes the built environment and its infrastructures, energy, resource and industrial operations, transportation, communication and the financial networks, agriculture, modern states and bureaucracies and social institutions in general. It traverses a multitude of scales and materialities from synthetic compounds to vast mining operations, from digital networks and algorithms transforming the world via symbolic logic to food additives transforming human bodies or those of their highly cultivated livestock. It's, a, it's something which we struggle to be aware of, but nonetheless, our lives are totally dependent upon the functioning of this large technosphere. We had some sense of this during the pandemic when supply chains were disrupted. The things which we took for granted were no longer available, and they disrupted the functioning of transportation systems and, of course, healthcare systems. Although we can be proud of many of the things that have been produced as the, as the, the evolution of this um, um, global technosphere, its rapidity of development and its huge impact has created what many people recognise now as a planetary emergency. We don't just live in a climate emergency, but a planetary emergency where a whole range of, of supportive systems are being challenged. And the major task that humanity faces in the very now and in the next foreseeable future is adapting of our modern technosphere to operate within what Rockstrom et al. have called the safe operating system of the planet. Um, the planetary boundaries work has identified some of the nine different boundaries which we need to operate within to actually maintain a sustainable and viable future. The idea of what we need to do in terms of a vision of change, of adaptation, of a great transition, has been captured by the notion of donut economics, um, coined by the, the economist, British economist Kate Rayworth. It's a lovely notion because it captures both the, the ceiling, the outer, the outer donut of planetary boundaries, uh, human technological development needs to function within those boundaries, but also has the floor of the sustainable development goals because um, environmental adaptation, ecological adaptation, has to go in concert with um, social justice and so on. So the notion of donut economics is a blueprint for how the world has to change. Um, Paul Raskin from the Telus Institute has done some scenario work in terms of, well, how are we going to, how is this great transition going to happen? And uh, Raskin's proposal is that we need to have a global citizens movement. Conventional worlds, either in terms of public policy or market forces, really aren't going to be enough. Um, it depends upon uh, bottom up activities of citizens actually mobilising. We have to put pressure on um, business academia and government to make a change. Raskin's optimism is based in part by the fact that there is already a massive amount of thing, stuff happening at a grassroots level. 
um, Paul Hawken wrote a book called Blessed Unrest, in which he talked about there is this under the radar. There are there are thousands and thousands of small organisations which are actually um, working their guts out to actually make a difference. To and we can see this in terms of the school strikes. We can see this in terms of um, extension rebellion are the most visible ones. But of course, uh, there are a lot, many, many people who are developing different economic models, developing resilience, and so on. So on the one hand, there is some ground for optimism that ordinary citizens can actually combine together to put pressure on their governments and on business to change, to make the great transition. However, on the other hand, um, the existence of some sort of culture of active citizenship has been eroded dramatically in recent decades, as we've heard from an earlier speaker. We now live in a culture which sees us as individualised consumers <coughs> rather than as citizens of politics. So for Raskin's um, proposal to be meaningful and realistic, to have hope in that, we need to have some pro a process of civic repair, a restoration of a culture of citizenship, which means that ordinary people can not be simply concerned about their own individual selfish needs or what they expect of their needs, but actually to participate in this great transition. The notion of citizenship needs to be richer than one we just take for granted. For most of us, citizenship means a kind of passive, limited um, identification with a particular nation state. We have citizenship, we can vote, we are part of this community, we have certain rights. It doesn't necessarily apply much more than that. But the kind of notion of citizenship that Paul Raskin is arguing for is one which is much more active, it's engaged, it's participatory. It's, it, it draws upon a different tradition of political life in which citizens are part of an ongoing process of conversation and um, policy formation. It also needs to be technologically literate. It also needs to be locally grounded with a global vision. I think one of the issues about citizenship is that does it strengthen the notion of nationalism in our national interest? We work for ourselves. The kind of citizenship that Paul Raskin is arguing for is one in which citizens are both rooted in a particular place, but also have a strong um, global vision. Um, Act locally, think globally, is really the slogan which goes back to the 70s. Um, in terms of technological literacy, which is a critical part of the kind of citizenship that Paul Raskin is, is arguing for, I've suggested it involves both basic and contextual understanding of socio-technical systems, food, energy, production, and so forth. As a basic understanding, it's not unrealistic for most of us to have much more than a rudimentary understanding of how systems work. But nonetheless, we do need some sense of how to find out about, about food production, you know, whether, whether Roundup is a dangerous chemical or not, uh, to be aware of the way in which things are made, um, the way in which they work, and what happens to them when they're, when they're discarded. Um, so that sort of, sort of rudimentary sense is pretty basic. Well, I just read recently um, a discussion about what happens to solar panels um, when they become um, discarded. There are massive numbers of solar panels being produced. So as a kind of civic awareness, one we should be aware, not that, great, isn't it great, renewable energy, more solar power, more solar panels, it's fantastic. Um, there's a basic question, what do we do with them when they're to be discarded? That's a whole range of ways in which we as ordinary citizens, as active citizens, um, have some sense of, of technology and how it works. But over and beyond that, we need to have a sense of the, the way in which technology and culture combine together. Andrew Shepard talked about that in a way, that technologies aren't just simply tools that we use, but actually forms of culture, that we need to be able to read our technologies to see what cultural expressions they, they, they reflect. Um, Langdon Winner talked about technologies as forms of life, ways of being in the world, that technology, as we inhabit our technologies, they change us and shape us in terms of who we are. To give more specificity to that, I think that um, as citizens, we need to be aware that the technologies that they develop and as they're being changed in the great transition are in, involved in a dialectical relationship with important contexts. And I've specified four contexts that are important to the way in which technologies are developed. Um, there is, of course, the corporate sector. Corporate, corporate uh, businesses um, have a particularly important role in, in interpreting the way our te socio-technical systems are developed. There's the role of the state in terms of government policy and regulation. And of course, a consumer culture, the way in which we as consumers expect technologies and technological systems to provide the goods for us. And we have a, have a significant influence on that. But also there is, as Andrew was referring to, a kind of metaphysical context that our technologies and socio-technical systems embody certain ways of relating to the world around us. 
The one that comes to mind for me is flying. I think there is a there is a sense of that as you as you are used to and inhabit aviation, there's, there's a sense of transcendence. We are we creatures and transcend the limits of nature, and so, so in all kinds of ways, automobility does that as well. The point I want to make though is that as we think about our technologies, and particularly during the time of tra the transition, we need to shape technologies in ways which don't just simply reflect the dominant context but actually reflect the kind of ways in which we think um, the economy should work, the way government should work, the way civil society should work, and what kind of metaphysical view we want to be expressed through our technologies. I see this as a missional challenge. How do we interpret our technological citizenship and how do we live out our technological citizenship in a way which reflects the, the vision of the gospel? There is dismayingly, in my view, a lack of thought and focus on citizenship as a, category, as a theological category. Um, sure, most Christians are expected to be good citizens in that kind of limited passive way, but to actually engage in the struggle of the kind of citizenship that Paul Raskin is talking about is, is something which we tend not to engage in. Um, I have a um, quote from a Mennonite theologian, Gordon Zerbe, this biblical language of citizenship, he writes, is in desperate need of recovery. While the language of discipleship has served as the core watchword for a few generations, there are significant limitations to it. For instance, discipleship is easily susceptible to an individualistic interpretation or practice, limited to a particular religious sphere of life. Moreover, it has become a church or Bible word, otherwise out of currency in the regular world. Not even a very good translation of the original words that it translates which we more closely mean something like menteeship, nor does it express very well the more original imagery of following. The notion of the citizenship, however, not only conjures up the crucial elements of personal loyalty and practice, but also that of a spiritual, social, and global ecological vision in Christ, along with a communal formation, mission, and identity. Even if an identity that confounds prior identities or undermines the very notion of identity, that is altogether a different kind of politics. Moreover, were we to keep talking about our Christian citizenship, both as an identity and as a practice, we would immediately and always be reminded that our Christian faith and practice as a citizen always cuts across other citizenship identities and responsibilities, sometimes in harmony with them, sometimes in conflict with them. At the same time, we may begin to regard our faith in Christ primarily as a dynamic loyalty that applies to all arenas of life, not as a dogmatic belief pertaining to the limited sphere of the spiritual or religious. The question is why why are we so um, silent, I guess, about citizenship? The thing underlying that is they what I've described as a fraying tradition of a separation between faith and politics. That Christians are focused on personal faith. Politics is something which you kind of keep separate, at least in our traditions. Although if you read anything about American um, Christian discussion these days, there is an extraordinary move to kind of for Christians to engage in politics to restore some kind of Christian hegemony over public life. So the, the whole issue about how we regard faith in politics is itself an important discussion which underlies this question of citizenship. I draw upon a post-liberal recovery of the relationship between faith and politics that um, has its um, recent expression in the work of John Yoder and Stanley Halvers. And there are three things that come out of not just their work, but also those who followed them. First of all, um, Christian faith is intrinsically political. Um, to be part of the polis, to be part of the ecclesia, is to be part of a new political community. It's not as though politics and something are separate, but there is a politics which is intrinsic, not just to the fact that we are people together with anything political, but rather we embody the politics of Jesus, as, as um, John wrote, wrote about it. But secondly, it's not something which is separate from the world, but it would involve in dialectical relationship with the rest of society. If you if we know anything about Christian history, the church has had to negotiate and has to find ways of, of articulating what it means to be God's people in the midst of various polities in which they found themselves. Thirdly and importantly, the world we live in, particularly the world that's shaped by Western European traditions, is, is already a deeply Christianized world. We don't, we're not just simply a, a bunch of Christians outside of a secular world. We live in a world which already is shaped by a, 
Christian imagination. And uh, the two authors I've referred to there that are particularly important for me are Oliver O'Donovan in his book, The Desire of the Nations, and more recently, Tom Holland's book, Dominion, um, which I think is a, a lovely exploration of the way in which Christian assumptions are now deeply embedded in our culture, even if they're not avowed by, by secular humanists. Of course, in our discussion about citizenship, we need to address the biblical material and, and there, there are the, the text in, in the New Testament. First, there is a Ephesians 2, Philippians 3, and of course, Hebrews, Hebrews 11, which suggests that citizenship is in heaven and that re therefore kind of separates us from civic involvement in the world. N.T. Wright argues that rather than reading Philippians 3 in terms of um, our citizenship is in heaven, he argues that we should read it as, as our citizenship is from heaven. Um, um, the, analogy, the analogy of those citizens, Roman citizens in Philippi, their citizenship was in Rome. It didn't mean to say that they needed to go to Rome, but rather their, the origin of their citizenship was from Rome. Likewise, he was saying that Christians living in the world, the first century, their citizenship was derived not from Caesar, but from Christ, who is the sovereign Lord. So he was suggesting not a, a view of disengagement, but rather of a different kind of engagement. Now, I think there's an exegetical issue there, but I think underlying that is how we, what kind of larger narrative frame we understand the gospel to be about. Is the gospel one of our saving us from this benighted and broken world, or is it the gospel about God's continuing faithfulness to his creation project to bring it to perfection um, in which his people play a crucial role? Um, I think it's the latter one which, which um, Tom Wright is expressing, and I think one which I think is... Um, is what the gospel is about. Um, God's purpose is not the um, destruction of this creation, but rather it's, it's preservation, it's protection, it's fulfillment, and technology plays an important part of that. Um, what it means, I think, therefore, is that, that in our Christian tradition, we should find ways of practicing form of citizenship which is eschatologically oriented towards the kingdom which is here but still to come, and which involves a much more critical and literate approach to technology, both in our church life and in our civic engagement. I would like to see in church communities much more serious discussion about the various socio-technical systems in which our lives are embedded, um, food production, energy production, um, the city. Um, the city is itself a major socio-technical system which shapes who we are, to engage with the, the, alongside other people with the question of, of how are we to be human in these, in these um, socio-technical systems. In terms of the wider context, I think the, 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 um, the most critical and strategic thing is to, almost there, is to um, engage in that metaphysical dimension which Andrew pointed to. As I said before, one of the important contexts, the kind of underlying assumptions of technological development is a view about how we humans are related not only to the non-human world, but also to any sense of transcendence. And what is extraordinary about so much technology is the search for transcendence is so culpable. Um, think of Elon Musk, think of Mark Zuckerberg, the whole aspiration to actually transcend the limits of nature. Um, that's kind of, there's a, there's a deeply um, religious dimension to modern technology. We need to find ways of engaging that in the context of our civic um, the struggle for the great transition through our practice, practice of citizenship. Um, I was going to mention Jacques Ellul, I'm glad, um, I'm glad Andrew did, but the other person I think who is a bit of an exemplar of this is, is Pope Francis. The Dado C was an interesting text, not just simply about the need to protect the environment, but the need to engage with what he described as the technocratic paradigm. By, by, by that he meant, the note, drawing on Rana Guadini, the, no, the notion that, that technology is a kind of instrumental control of the natural world. That's what under, underpins so much of technology. To re recover a sense not of, of that kind of human domination of an objective nature, but rather to recover our creaturely dependence upon the gift of God and a sacramental ontology, that the world in which we live is suffused with the goodness and greatness of God. It is not God, it is not divine, but rather it is a world which actually draws its, its, its being and its meaning from the generosity and goodness of God. That's what came through in Laudato Si, and I think one of the reasons people responded to it. So much of the discussion about the Great Transition is in secularist terms. It doesn't actually open up these questions. 
but they're there. And I think um, many people are recognising that they need to be opened up. We do so as Christians, not as simply outsiders making philosophical comments, but rather as engaged citizens who are able to articulate the questions about where the world's going, or what the transition will involve. I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian, for a very articulate presentation. Uh, a lot of uh, wisdom and experience there, a lot of thought. Uh, we'll open the floor up now to uh, question time. We've got uh, at least five minutes. We did start our presentation a bit late, but we'd like to finish on time. So at least five minutes of questions. Um, I'm looking in Slido. Um, there aren't any questions appearing in Slido right now. Uh, Claire has a question. Media conversation starter. It's Black Friday, and I'm being encouraged to buy lots. <laughs> I'm wondering what creaturely resistance looks like when you still have media and the market telling us that our civic duty is to be good consumers and to buy, 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 and that we'll do us in. So, what, what do responses of resistance look like? How creative and mobile ads do we need to get when there's these deeply conflicting narratives? Yeah, um, I, mean, I, th I think, can you come up to the front? Of the camera, please. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you um, for the question. Um, I, I think not, it's, it's a matter of not being um, um, defensive in response. And sorry, Ian, can you actually kind of vaguely repeat the question um, because it won't be okay. all that easy for people in other lands to... Um, yeah. It's clear, isn't it? Claire was pointing out today is Black Friday and we are encouraged as part of our, our contemporary civic duty to actually go out and buy. And that's, that's a very important point because a lot of people would say that to keep the economy going, we need consumers to buy, buy more preferably, uh, which cuts across what I've been talking about. My response is that we shouldn't be defensive in saying, uh, and, and becoming, you know, we're not going to buy, but rather to actually provide ways of, of, of embodying a different kind of economy. Um, that one of the things that I think is exciting is that the people who are working on what's called a civic economy, which actually takes seriously the, both the um, ecological, but also the social dimensions of economic activity. So, for example, um, worker cooperatives, an example of that in, in terms of, um, of food production and, and material production, um, and all sorts of other ways. Um, the circular economy idea is, is, is a very constructive and positive thing, the, rec the recognition that we can no longer have a um, what Annie Leonard called the, the, the linear story of stuff, where you dig things up, you process them, and you chuck them out. And then it's, it's Black Friday feeds into that kind of, you know, we're in a different narrative, which recognises the, the constraints on resources, the, the responsibility of proper use, and, and also how you dispose of stuff. It, it reminds me, actually, you, um, uh, the War on Waste television series, one of the most, I found, most extraordinary um, episodes was where Craig Rosalek um, meets with this, bunch, this group of young teenage girls for whom any piece of clothing was worn once. The great insight that he provided for them was that they could actually mix and match the clothing they had. Um, the, the, and that's, that's, so there is a battle going on, but I think that what I'm, I guess what I was saying in a long-winded way is we need to actually engage in that in a much provide an alternative rather than like we did in the 70s, say, I'm not going to buy anything. Thank you. Hey, thanks uh, once more for a narrow and accessible talk. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit more. You, you started talking about the Anthropocene and the technosphere, and I'm wondering whether or not you could think more specifically about the Anthropocene's Capitalocene and its origins in settler colonialism and so on, uh, and how that. Can you repeat the question? It's a long question. <laughs> yep. mixed, mixed question was, um, do we need to focus not just on the Anthropocene, which implies a kind of general humanity, but rather the capital I've seen? And I, I'm not sure what the term would use for the, the colonial I've seen, I suppose, would be another way of putting it as well. But rather, rather the, the, the technosphere which has been developed is, is not innocent with respect to power relationships, but also coloniality. Um, now, I, th I think, I mean, I, I really agree with you, and it's part of the kind of critical reflection about technology to recognise the technologies in which we live are not innocent. I mean, we kind of know that because um, what's, what's really deeply embedded in our fossil fuel culture is a particular set of political relationships. Um, and of course, in so much of, and, and we can see that in the, in the COP27 discussions, the, the notion of loss and damage, how, how fraught that whole issue is. 
that that um, as developing countries are saying you guys are responsible for most of what's happened now so you need to actually help us to get out of it so i guess i guess it's it's really taken on board that that um when, when i mentioned as one of the contexts we're in the, the corporate world it's part of that that capitalism has been the and continues to be the driving force i mean it's it is unconscionable i may say so the way in which fossil fuel companies and governments continue investing in fossil fuels, not, not, not sort of just, oh, we have to do it, we need to make the transition. But let's make as much money out of it as we can until it's too late. And that's, that's so, so there's a, there's a um, the principalities and powers are very powerful. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Um, there is another question here uh, that's come up on Slido. I'll just read it out for the online audience. Um, could Ian repeat the name of the Mennonite theologian he quoted regarding the need to utilize citizenship uh, compared with discipleship? A name of author and book, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't have the book reference at hand, but Gordon Zerbe, Z E R B E. Um, I'm sure if you Google him, then it'll come up. <laughs> yep, yep. Thanks, Ian. Sorry. <laughs> So another question on Slido. Um, uh, wondering if Ian can reflect on the fact that political citizenship is not only emasculated in contemporary Christianity, uh, but is also distorted within society. Appreciate your comments there. Thank you. That's a Dorothy Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's, as I, as I indicated, talking about Paul Raskin's things, that's one of the things that actually makes it so much harder to actually develop a kind of a civic movement that we've we've so I think we've had 40 years of economic reform which is focused on market relationships as being primary rather than the kind of preceding notion where governments actually enable um, public sphere activities um, we've been turning to consumers rather than the citizens so I think I absolutely agree and that's part of the challenge we have I think as part of our, our Christian rehabilitation in all of the process of civic repair is to actually um, defend and restore public inst and civic institutions, uh, which includes public schooling. And one of the one of the um, the notions of a strong civic culture is the investment in public schooling, which recognises that all people need to be provided with the resources to develop a kind of sense of place in a wider society. We, we are seeing the bitter fruits of that. Um, um, diminishing of citizenship in the kind of responses of modern populism um, and the sort of hostility towards elite, elites, including scientific and technical elites in our culture. So uh, again, it's another one of those challenges, but I think we need to um, grasp the vision. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ian. Um, well, I'm looking at the time, it's 11.51. It's time that we wrap up this stream and I really thank everyone for joining Thank everyone for your questions, both here and online. It's been a great discussion and I'd like to thank Ian. Can we give Ian a big round of applause? <laughs>